So basically, Matthew Mercer has taken an event that at first half the party had zero interest in being at, and the other half of the party had no business being at, and he's turned it into a heist filled with plot hooks. I filled the whole journal. It's full. It took me over two months and filling an entire Loic term 1977, but I have caught up on campaign three. For those of you who are new here, hello, my name is Zoe. I am narrative and lore obsessed. With the egress of Wizards Unite, I obviously need something new to hyper-focus my weird plot conspiracy mind onto. We're gonna be going over the first 14 episodes of Critical Role through this lens of episodes 13 and 14, because I feel like they encompass, like all of the plot threads just happen in the span of like two hours at this ball. We start out episode 13 with the group that will become known as Bell's Hells. They're rolling up on the venue, and this is the Chende Quorum Halls. We know where the Chende Quorum meets. We still don't know who is on the Chende Quorum. I find suspicious. So they have two goals while they are there. Locate Armand Treshi and replace the ring on his finger with one that they can track. They also have to try and figure out a few of the members of the Shande Quorum. I'm sure it felt like a good idea at the time for the members of your ruling elite to be completely anonymous, but like now that seems like it probably should not be a thing. So first let's start with Armand Treshi and we're gonna be covering, recovering a lot of the stuff that have already happened in campaign three. Obviously this episode contains spoilers. It contains spoilers for campaign one, campaign two, and campaign three, and obviously spoilers for Exandria Unlimited. Why did I say obviously? That might not be obvious. So the first time we hear about the Treshy house is when we find out that they were responsible for repairing the alley behind the Dreamscapes Theater where Bell's Hells found a mimic. There, it might have been a roper, but I'm pretty sure it was just a mimic. I, we kept joking that Matt was just gonna throw an entire room of mimics at them. No, 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 no. He threw a whole street of mimic at them. So they were there, they left a bunch of repair stuff in the alley, and then they just buggered off with apparently not repairing anything at all in the alley. The Mimic's body was also found to have these weird little disc things with like teeth in them that were attached all around this Mimic's body, which makes me think it would be, it was being controlled or held onto somehow or tracked even. I don't know. We don't know what those little discs do yet, but I have some ideas. I have ideas. I think it's either a way to keep it docile to so that like they could destroy it if they needed to, if it started to be like a little too aggro, like, like whole house Mimic. Ugh. I'm getting campaign two AR vibes. <sighs> the next time we hear about House Treshy is that the Gold Guild was responsible for transporting a package with JH to a place. We don't really fully know where, because all of this information comes from Cyrus, and Cyrus is Prince of Himbos. He didn't know that the members who were also hired to guard this caravan we're going to try and rob it. And then they pinned it on him and they stole a golem from a cart marked JH on it. And JH turns out to be Jana Hexum and Jana Hexum is who is employing Ashton. We'll get there, we'll get there eventually. Just, just buckle up. Cyrus Wyvernwyn, Dorian's brother, now has a 20,000 gold bounty on his head set by Jana Hexum. And we'll get to Cyrus in a second because, oh my God. Treshy also hired a very, very prominent bounty hunter by the name of Vali Dortana. And she's apparently an absolute badass. Like, she's like Boba Fett salt, just like, ugh. She was hired to go and get Gurge, who was a known lycanthrope, capture him alive so that they could do experiments on him in the moon tower. So basically, Matthew Mercer has taken an event that at first half the party had zero interest in being at, and the other half of the party had no business being at, and he's turned it into a heist filled with plot hooks. We notice that Jana Hexum is here. Jana is one of Ashton's clients, and Jana hired Ashton after they tossed her office with the rest of the Nobodies, who is Ashton's old crew. They fell out of her window because she blasted them with some sort of arcane force and they had to have their body repaired with the gold from this particular job by Milo, who used, and I quote, chaos fairy magic bullshit. This sets off all of the alarm bells for me because we know who in the past has been a rather chaotic fae. Artagon, I think, I think 
here's my theory about Milo. I think Milo may have used to have been a follower of the Traveler or maybe their parents were. And then after the Traveler had that whole thing with the Moonweaver, I think maybe then they turned to the Traveler as a fey patron and maybe Milo is like some sort of warlock, maybe a cleric, maybe a warlock. I don't know. Now I think that Artagan is the one who is responsible for healing Ashton. Nevertheless, now Jana Haxum just has Ashton on a leash, making them do things for her whenever she wishes. As the party is moving through, Imogen tries a couple of things, but they aren't working out. Imogen is very interesting because she seems to have some sort of telekinesis, aberrant mind thing happening, and I freaking love it. But she has never been in a crowd this size, and there's a lot of people, and because she's still working on her telekinesis, this size of a crowd is a little bit daunting for her, and a lot of voices are starting to creep in, and she's getting a little overwhelmed. As we have been hanging out with Imogen, she has been looking into all sorts of interesting theories around patrons and sorcery, and where exactly do people get their magic from inherently? She is researching why the heck did this happen to me and why do I keep having nightmares with red storms? The first time we see it happen is when Bertrand Bell dies. As Bertrand Bell is being murdered by Duggar, who we will get to, Imogen has a vivid and recurring nightmare of a tempest. For a moment she is frozen in fear and then the voice of what she is sure is her mother comes through and tells her to run. She takes off running, peeking over her shoulder only to see Bertrand Bell step into the Tempest. She wakes up, convinced that he is in danger, and she and the whole party go find him. And of course, he is dead, stabbed repeatedly by a very, very familiar weapon. Imogen explains that though she has had this recurring nightmare many, many times in the past, th this is the first time that it has been a prophetic recurring nightmare, which, ugh, Great, that's fun. The second time we see Imogen have this dream, she sees a pair of figures she is convinced are the Loomis twins stepping into the Tempest as well. The Loomis twins checked out a book that she was using to research Red Tempest dreams that had the name of her own mother as one of the test subjects in the margins. And then the rest of the study had been torn out. The last people to check that book out were the Loomis twins who are studying weird things in the Odiran wilds, and hopefully we will get to all of that very soon because I'm, I have questions, I have questions. As Imogen is struggling with the voices and thoughts of all of the people in this room just encroaching on her own personal mind space bubble, Fresh Cut Grass is off to get cocktails and Fresh Cut Grass is an automaton who can heal people. Fresh Cut Grass has an interesting backstory where he was out on like a normal mission for him and his companions and woke up in the middle of the night to his entire party being slaughtered by a creature with one eye, including his creator, Dancer. He looked upon as they were just eviscerated by this thing. And he doesn't remember it. Or he has put up a wall of emotion there where he can't, that he can't get past in order to remember the actual events that transpired that killed his entire party. My own theory kind of falls in line with pretty much what everybody else is thinking, which is that fresh cut grass was not made like three years ago. Instead, he was made during the time of Arcana and is in fact one of the remnants of the automatons that were found in Aeor. The Mighty Nine found Devexian while they were exploring the weird and creepy halls of Aeor. And Devexian, when he woke up, was pretty happy-go-lucky. He didn't, he had a lot of glitches. He didn't fully function very well. And the description of him being like C-3PO on the back of Chewbacca was pretty apt. <laughs> After he woke up, he was much more serious and focused. So maybe once Fresh Cut Grass gets his memories back, he won't be this happy-go-lucky guy anymore. I hope not. I want him to still be like the, the well smiley day to you. I think it's just the cutest thing. While the Mighty Nine were roaming those same halls, they also found a chamber that used dudomancy to give you the effects of a long rest in the matter of seconds. This, along with the fact that AR was also researching ways to kill the gods, the big reason why they took down the floating cities in the Age of Arcana. 
If in the Age of Arcana they also figured out how to make an automaton that could heal people using the power of the gods without actually using the power of the gods, that would be a big reason to want to take down those floating cities, I feel. It's entirely possible that FCG's memories of Dancer aren't actually memories from just three years ago, they're actually from thousands of years ago from the Age of Arcana. And I think Ashton found them in one of the mines, accidentally resurrected them and brought them back with them thinking that only a short time had lapsed. As everybody in the party is settling in and trying to figure out what the ins and outs of this party are, this Ark's big bad comes in and they are Paragon's Call, a group of mercenaries who are known for doing whatever it takes to get the job done. Matt describes them as a group of Mad Max extras who have barely put any effort into polishing themselves up for this event. There might be more members of the Paragon's Call, but the five that we see, General Artanish, who is a Goliath barbarian, some sort of intense human person, a tiny minotaur? They make, they make, they make, small minotaurs and I love this. Another half orc and a scrappy gnome who is sitting there peeling their fingers out of sheer nervousness of being at the ball. It's known that Paragon's Call as of late has been rubbing elbows with some of Drusar's more elite. It's also worth noting that Gurge, as he was held captive in the moon tower, says that he was forced to bite some people who were heavily armored, but definitely were not wardens of the city. They looked like cell swords. So who's a lycanthrope in that group now? Yikes. Finally, Armand Treshi walks in, who is looking pretty suave. He looks pretty slick. And on his arm is someone new, and she's going to become relevant very soon, but her name is Lady Emoth Cad. And she's apparently an apprentice in Treshi's Gold Guild. And she's looking real pale, like she's real sick. Meanwhile, Chetney is sticking close to the group's patron, Lord Estros, who does not want to be there, and his sheer nervousness attracts the attention of a goblin, who turns out to be... What's his name? Gris Alacritos, which... Gray Alacrity? The little goblin man also does not want to be there. Points out that they are with their friend, Ajit Dayal. Ajit Dayal is a member of a thing called the Gorg Gorgiani? Gorgiani, Gorgia, I can't, I forget how it's spelled like this. And they are an elite sect of warriors who specialize in hemocraft, i.e. they're blood hunters with lycanthropy, which is heckin' cool. And they have learned how to hone the craft and control the curse of their lycanthropy so that they're not terrible about it. Chet's friend Gurge also ran with them for a time before he had a falling out with them. Gurge does not seem to be a great person if he has managed to burn every single bridge in his life, including that with Chetney. I cannot wait to hear what exactly Gurge did to have a falling out with everybody else in the Gorgiani. Unfortunately, this quickly falls by the wayside because Dorian, while trying to get the attention of Armand Treshi, instead attracts the attention of someone completely different. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Preston Drodalon comes up. Well, as they were talking, it turns out he is the Lord of the Quad Roads. In campaign one, you remember how somehow the character with the lowest intelligence of the group somehow got a deck of many things. And then he made somebody else, this poor drunk guy, pull a card in the middle of, of Isilra. Yeah. It's that guy, the guy that got two, was it two wishes or three? It, the guy who got the wishes. <sighs> Campion Black has made a fantastic comparison video that if you have not watched yet, you should definitely watch because it's so good. The link will be in the doobly-doo. Lord Drodalon then points out a Bowie-esque androgynous halfling named, what is it, Gavis? Oh yes, Gavis, and points everybody in his direction being like, that's the voice of the quorum. You should go talk to that dude. Meanwhile, Orem, who is just clocking everything, notices that Lord Treshy's date is just gone. And then Orem spots her talking with a familiar figure. <sighs> it's Cyrus. So yeah, remember how I was talking about Janna Hexum and how she's like here and has a 20,000 gold bounty out on this man and he's just hanging out in a party with the woman who has a 20,000 gold bounty on him, thinking he's totally fine because his cheekbones are covered by a mask. Cyrus is not crown prince of the Silken Squall. No, he's crown prince of the Himbos. He should never be left unattended under any 
circumstances. So after Gavis gives like the opening speech, people start kind of giving him crap because there's a lot of weird stuff happening in the city. Like, oh, I don't know, the inciting incident of the campaign where a bunch of random materials came to life after an arcane explosion overturned a cart. So yeah, he gets some crap called out on him, but he ignores it and carries on anyway. I don't know what's going on with the ruling elite of this city, but they need to get their ish together. After the crowd disperses from the speech, FCG picks up some interesting conversations as they're rolling around, i.e. The, the Stratos, 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 the Stratos throne turned down their invitation to the event and they get called bumpkins. I'm still working on research of what the Stratos throne is other than like things that happened with the Apex War and all of this other stuff. I'm really hoping that these are more lore drops that we're going to get later on. I don't know who the Stratos throne are. All I know is that they rule in the Hellcatch Valley. Up next is the Dance of the Crossroads, which is basically a forced networking dance like speed dating dance thing. It's kind of interesting. I don't know how useful it is, but you know, they do it every year. So now it's tradition. So they're just going to do it because tradition. Dorian and Fern start to try and get themselves in position so that they can take the ring off Treshi because they surmise that this is probably the best time. And this is where, oh, this is a lot. It's, it's a lot. It's already very difficult in order to get in with the person that you're gonna wanna speak with because this is basically a game of chess disguise as a dance because everybody's vying for somebody's attention and you kind of have to beat out whoever that is with dexterity in order to get in, like elbow your way in and be like, you're dancing with me, now you can't get rid of me. Fern finally gets passed off to Treshy and starts talking him out. Meanwhile, our girl Imogen gets into his brain to see what his thoughts are. And most of his thoughts have to do with the fact that he he recognizes Fern as a fey creature and is worried that the Nightmare King has sent somebody else to talk to him. First mention of the Nightmare King that we get is in episode nine, when Chetney breaks into Vali Dortana's office in the Moon Tower and finds a ledger in a desk as he's trying to figure out how to get into the secret basement. Secret door, secret door, secret door, secret door, secret door. And finds an entry about the Nightmare King who is requesting someone to be taken alive. Because you know, nothing says big deep crime than a ledger and an invoice from someone called the Nightmare King. What's this? A charge for my services so you can be kept up to date. Oh, cool, thanks. Wait, we're doing crime. When Fern hears the name the Nightmare King, she remembers stories that she was told by her grandmother back in the Feywild of somebody who took pleasure in taking nature and twisting it. Oh yeah, that sounds pretty familiar. They broke into the Moon Tower eventually and found him in the basement with Gurge and like another bug thing in a different cell working on these weird crystals. And he was talking about, oh no, now we have to move shop because people are being shady around us and all of this other stuff. It turns out he was running experiments on Gurge. Well, of course, combat freaking breaks out. And then during combat, he catches Fern's scent and recognizes her family name, Callaway, just by sniffing her. As the fight continues and it's obvious that they might end up going towards a TPK considering both of their healers go down. It was such a stressful fight. Oh my goodness. The Nightmare King and Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. He starts to teleport out of there, but before he does, you know, just because he's a villain, he decides to go the full Invader Zim route and blow up the entire tower. Please! Oh yeah, and by the way, while they were fighting him, he pulled a very familiar trick in animated furniture. I wonder what that is from. Oh yeah, the inciting incident of how the entire party got together. There's one mystery solved. Who is animating furniture? It's this guy and he's an arch fay and oh my God. Okay, back to the attempt to getting the ring. So Fern starts talking this guy down. Oh, don't worry. I'm not here to talk to you. I want to talk to Gavis. And so she gets Treshy to spin her into dancing with Gavis. And as she does this, she attempts to pull the ring off of Treshy's finger. And this is where literally everybody was just, she actually succeeds in doing this, but Treshy super duper notices because like a thumb ring pull, you would probably notice that. And she lets the ring drop to the ground so that the sound of it rolling away is kind of heard, which I get. And instead of grabbing the ring off the ground and doing a sleight of hand trick to just hand him the tracking ring, Dorian kicks the real ring away in front of Treshy. 
they did a little quick break planning segment during that like 15 minutes and that's not a lot of time to plan something so it's entirely possible that Robbie who is playing Dorian didn't understand what the plan was and got a little you know flustered in the heat of the moment when it was all on him and you know did something wrong which happens to all of us in our D&D &D games, doesn't it? <laughs> Luckily, FCG is there to save the day. They scoop it up and it's in their possession. Okay, we're rolling. Now all we gotta do is have somebody pretend to find the ring and get it on Treshy's finger. The real ring gets hucked around to several different people. It's very weird. And then finally, finally, the fake ring gets into the hands of Imogen, who stands up after mining looking around for it and they finally get it onto Treshy's hand. Okay, there we go. There's goal one, check, ding. We're good to go. All of the drinks were had after that because that was stressful. Lana danced with General Rotanish there for a second and then basically gets abandoned on the dance floor because it's Lana and she's undead and a little creepy and oh, by the way, has freaking Delilah Briarwood in her head as our patron maybe? Oh my gosh. I'm not actually sure if it is Delilah Briarwood. It could very well be Delilah Briarwood. Or wouldn't it be interesting if somebody who grew up in Whitestone at the time that the Briarwoods were in power instead was corrupted by somebody who knew who was in power in Whitestone at the time and was trying to travel across planes in order to corrupt the entire world and that's actually her patron. I think maybe Vecna might be her patron and she doesn't know yet and she thinks that it's actually Delilah Briarwood and that's really, really bad. I don't think that Matt will let it get to the point where Vecna tries to come across the Divine Gate again after he was sealed away. Undoing the job of a previous campaign that was literally the arc, it was the climax of the campaign, that's not how you want to do a D&D game. You don't want the like all of the work that you worked so hard to overcome in a previous campaign to be undone in the next one. That's not fun. But I do think it would be interesting to have Laudna have Vecna as her patron at least for a second, but then try to take more sorcery levels instead and try to pull a Ford. Because Ford was able to keep all of his warlock levels after denying Ukotoa, who was basically trying the same thing. He was trying to come across the plains and be resurrected again. So I'm really hoping that we get a Ford part two because what Travis pulled with Ukatoa was iconic. And I'd love to see it happen again. Ladna clocks Volley Dortana across the way who has definitely clocked Ashton. And Ashton decided that it was a good idea that after they blew up the moon tower, okay, they didn't blow it up. Technically the Nightmare King blew it up to put on a Nightmare King mask and then go to a ball with a bunch of elite. And they were like, oh, clock who gets upset about it. But you know what happens when you're upset at a ball where there's a bunch of bodyguards around? The bodyguards come up and like to see what the heckity heck is up. So who comes over? General Ratanish of Paragon's Call. After talking to Vali Dortana, definitely comes over and immediately starts talking to Ashton about, whoa, dude, what's with the mask? Ratanish asks Ashton their name and Ashton refuses to give them and then Ratanish rips the mask off of Ashton's face and Ashton proceeds to slap General Ratanish so hard that literally everybody does the, you know, the anime <gasps> thing and I loved it, it was everything all of it, but now it's time to take it outside because it's dual time, kids. <laughs> Meanwhile, Chetney, our fantastic blood hunter werewolf gnome, which I love the fact that he is a werewolf gnome. It, he's, he's, he's a chihuahua and I love that. Chetney has followed Lady Emoth back into the quorum chambers where there are bedrooms set up so that the elite who get a little tipsy during the event can have somewhere to go crash and they're not like wandering around being a nuisance in Dressar. He follows her back to a room where she is being super creepy and tossing a room with Oh, I don't know, shade creepers? Looks super creepy because she looks exactly like Duggar. 
Have we not go gone over Duggar yet? Because I feel like we should have gone over Duggar yet because I feel like we've gone over everything else. Okay, here we go. Here's Duggar. So like the first time we start talking to Lord Estros, he's like, okay, here's your trial run. I need you to go to this textiles warehouse that I have. And I'm pretty sure that somebody has been stealing things from this textile warehouse. So I need you to figure out who that is. And so Bell's Hells, by the time still have Bertrand Bell with them, go to this warehouse and they start snooping around and they talk to the man the manager named Dannis. And Dannis is acting a little shady and there's a bunch of crates that are there and they check out the crates and it turns out the crates have like weird little pockets in them and they also have like pockets of food and pockets with residue of a thing called broomstone. And broomstone used to be used back in the age of Arcana for keeping like the floating cities a lot. And now it's used for airships, which is pretty cool. But basically it's as heavily controlled as plutonium and why the heck would a textiles warehouse be smuggling it? Like I said, Dennis was being particularly shady. And so Imogen and Bertrand Bell follow her back to a tavern where she eventually shakes them. They go back to the warehouse. They start talking to the rest of the party. The rest of the party then uncovers a ledger and some invoices. And it turns out, oh yeah, Dennis is definitely responsible for cooking the books. So they rush back to the tavern where this person was and they finally find her and she is up in a room talking to somebody else. And that person is not happy that the Bell's Hells were poking around and proceeds to kill her. They can't get the door kicked down in time to save her. And it's kind of sad because they probably could have saved her because it sounds like she was being threatened and that's heckin' sad. The party tried to stop him, but he got away and then he found Bertrand Bell in an alley later and stabbed Bertrand, which is also not great. The party then has basically like a vengeance motive. He is their Coulson essentially. They go back and they absolutely curb stomp Duggar. Dorian gets the killing blow, which I think is fantastic. And now we have somebody who is also like the weird corrupted shade creeper creepy slime person that Duggar was with a bunch of shade creepers at the party who's with Armand Treshi and all of this is bad. Also apparently this creepy slime person shade creeper thing is talking to Cyrus who is Dorian's brother and why is Dorian here and how is he caught up in this and this is bad. By the way, we can't find Cyrus now. He went to the bathroom and he disappeared. This is fine. Everything's fine. First 30 minutes of episode 14 are just Ashen getting his ass handed to him by General Ritanish. And after the fight is over, Orem clocks Gavis talking to a well-dressed human woman in about her 50s. She talks to Gavis, then she goes and she talks to Armand Treshi very animatedly, kind of heatedly for a couple of minutes. And then she proceeds to just go around the room and talk to a bunch of other people. She doesn't talk to these people for very long and she keeps her exchanges very brief. Orem is suspecting she might be on the council, which could very well be true. We don't don't have that confirmed yet and I just need it confirmed because oh my god. Lord Eshra says that this is Orlana Shadar and her house is apparently a minor house of Mahan. She deals in livestock. She's not that important. She's got some beef with Treshi. <laughs> You know, because they took it outside. Ashton gets called back in by Paragon's call. They pour him a drink and then continue their interrogation about why the heck does Ashton have a Nightmare King mask? And Ashton just says he was paid to be here and wear a mask. And that's what he's doing. He's technically not wrong. He was paid to be there and wear a mask. Not maybe that mask. <laughs> Ritanish then heavily implies that he knows that Ashton was at the Moon Tower and maybe he shouldn't have showed up right after he was present at the Moon Tower when it like definitely exploded. Meanwhile, Chetney's back at the back room because he cannot leave that ish alone. They try to come up with a couple of different ways to try and get into the bathrooms to see if Cyrus is there because they need to get Cyrus the heck out of here because again, he's standing in the middle of a ballroom with the person who has a 20,000 gold bounty on it with only his cheekbones covered. They s essentially send a couple of guards to their death, attempt to find Cyrus, don't find Cyrus, fight breaks out. They kind of save the guard and, and then they get back to the outside and see that Cyrus is being led away by a couple of detectives known as the Green Seekers. And I'm very excited about the Green Seekers. I love the Green Seekers so much. They're going to be so good. I'm so here for it. Dorian <sighs> then throws a smoke grenade into the middle of the room, runs into the smoke, arms the half-orc who has his brother. Then Lord Estoros comes in and smacks the gnome in the Green Seekers and they get back to the house with Dorian's idiot himbo brother in tow. And now Dorian has to leave, which sucks. I was very much on team. Let Dorian be at the table forever because we freaking love, we freaking love Robbie and wanted him to just be there for 
forever, but it, it doesn't look like that was going to be the case from the get-go. He had to go at some point, which is why he had an idiot himbo brother who was going to get them caught at some point, and this was just the time to do it. They give Dorian the Sending Stone, they finally solidify on a name, and that's episodes 13 and 14. Oh yeah, by the way, during the fight with Lady Emoth Cad, we found out that Imogen has the feet Fey touched. It gives you kind of a boost to one of your mind scores, but also gives you the really cool ability to Misty Step once per long rest without expending a spell slot. <laughs> or you can expend a spell slot if you just, you know, want to for reasons and can. But that means at some point Imogen had contact with the Fae, so we once again have another art, like another Fae thing Basically, at this point, I'm really hoping we get to the Feywild because I think there's a lot of Fey stuff happening between freaking the Nightmare King and Imogen and Fern and also Ashton being put together by Chaos fa Fairy stuff. There are so many more theories to come and I am going to record a second video, which is going to be episodes 15 and 16. I'm hopefully going to get that before episode 17 shows up because this is the seven year anniversary of Critical Role and oh my gosh, what in the heck? There's a lot happening and we're going to wrap up another story arc in the next two episodes. Episodes. You need to let me know what your theories are because I want to know because I have lots of theories too. Don't forget that if you like this, you can become one of my patrons on Patreon and you will get access to my notes immediately after the Critical Role broadcast, which is super cool and you should do that. You can also hang out with me in a voice chat call on Discord if you want to come and hang out with me and watch me freak out and write notes in real time. That is another perk that you get. If you're like, I just made some really cool new merch, this encompasses the whole brand. This is it. This is what you get here. Sorry, not sorry. Thank you so much for watching this. This is basically what I'm doing now that Wizards Unite is not a thing. So I hope that you will be able to stick around with this. And if you are new, hi, thanks for hanging out with me for so long. This is, I know it's gonna be a long one. Hopefully the next one will be a little shorter. Thanks for watching all of this. I appreciate you. I don't know what my sign off is anymore. I love you always, I guess, because reasons, okay, bye.